Welcome to Cool Talk. Today we discuss a movement so powerful and so appealing that it is still resonating today, the Renaissance. In the Middle Ages, if you were born a serf, you were a serf for life, and so it's been throughout history. Slaves, servants, peasants, and serfs accepted their role in life and questioned little. Only the nobility, royalty, and the church had the time and the means to express different ideas. That was about to change. In earlier videos, we discussed how the Crusades stimulated the growth of towns, the exchange of commerce, trade routes, and culture. And as merchant families grew rich, so did many merchant city-states, especially in Italy, Venice, Florence, Milan, and Genoa. In the 1500s, the Venetians had a fleet of 3,000 ships. In Florence, the textile industry alone employed 30,000 people. A lot of people were making a lot of money. And what happens when the merchants get rich? Well, they hire people to do things for them, and they just enjoy life. Wealthy people with nothing to do enjoy leisurely activities, dance like goofballs, and tell lame jokes. Eventually, a lot of them grow to have an appreciation for the arts, and they become patrons of the arts. This goes on even today. Italy took the lead. The Este family supported paintings, as did the Medicis. In fact, Pope Leo X, who came from the Medici family, made Rome a great center of art and learning. Because of this new middle class, rich merchants did not have to accept their station in life. You could acquire wealth and power, break down barriers, express your own ideas, criticize old customs, and glory in your own strength. In 1532, Niccolo Machiavelli published The Prince, a political guide, a thin volume of a set of practical rules on how a strong ruler should govern. Machiavelli believed that society was subject to the interest of men, not tradition or any moral code. The prince was criticized as callous and evil. You may have heard the term, the end justifies the means. Machiavelli wrote that he believed in success and hanging on to power by any means necessary. Now, we may disagree, but if you read the prince, the blueprint is admittedly practical in offering a path for developing a strong nation. It is widely read today. The prince is especially read by corporate yuppies who think that they are kings of the world. Humanism. Humanism is the movement wherein man is to live a full life, better himself in this world, and not just expect improvements in the next life. So began this revived interest in learning, in bettering one's physique, one's health, one's skills, and one's mind. This way of thinking is still prevalent today. Check out these advertisements. Don't settle for less. Hustle to be the best. Be grateful for all you have, but never settle for less than you can be. And of course, be all that you can be. This culture that still exists today pushes us to excel, and we celebrate the underdog, the person who starts at the bottom and comes out on top. Even if you lose, Lose, lose royally. Now, striving for excellence can be very good. It's good to have a little bit of ambition and to improve your mind, but not if you become an intellectual snob. If you're looking for health, it's good to exercise and better your physique, but not at the expense of hurting your body by shooting up steroids. So, striving for perfection has its downfalls. Italian writer Francesco Petrarch dedicated his life to studying classical writings. He was a prolific writer himself, traveled all over Europe, and his writings were full of human emotions, many love sonnets, and he is known as the father of humanism. Another humanist, Giovanni Boccaccio, wrote The Decameron. The Decameron is a series of stories that ridicule feudal customs. Dante Alighieri wrote The Divine Comedy, the story of a soul's journey to God through hell, purgatory, and heaven. The church, of course, was alarmed. Science and reason was taking over literature and art. Theology was taking a back seat. However, keep in mind that not many atheists came about at this time. Most of the humanists, for the most part, wanted to reform the church and its teachings. They didn't want to depart from it. And by the way, Renaissance in French means rebirth. 
artists such as Giotto di Bondoni in Florence gave his figures a sense of movement. He decorated churches with his frescoes. Florence became the art center of Europe, and Florentines mastered the techniques of perspective. Leonardo da Vinci only left 20 paintings, but his influence was great. Detailed backgrounds, formal composition. He was also an engineer, an architect, a designer of canals and buildings, military devices. He studied chemistry, geology, and the human anatomy. The Mona Lisa is one of the most valuable paintings in the world today. The composition, the enigmatic look, the smile, uh, the modeling of form, the atmospheric illusions the uh, shadows, expressionism. But what was so special about the Mona Lisa is the influence that it gave other painters of its day who decided to imitate that style and study it. One example is Raphael. Other famous da Vinci paintings, The Virgin of the Rocks and The Last Supper. Sculptor and painter Michelangelo. He was not interested in money or comfort. All he needed to be happy was some bread, some cheese, a bed, and his workshop. He often would sleep with his clothes on so as not to waste time. Michelangelo was driven. He would work hard, so hard that his face would wrinkle with concentration, his eyes were strained, and his back became bent with effort. His statue of David held his vision of the ideal hero, fine features, supple body. The Pieta, the young Mary holding the body of the dead Jesus in her lap, classical beauty mixed with naturalism. His statue of Moses, hands with veins, strong muscles, folds, the tablets. But what Michelangelo is best known for is for painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. He was commissioned by Pope Julius II to paint frescoes on the walls and ceiling. So he lied on his back on scaffolds and painted 300 figures over 10,000 square feet over a period of four years. Raphael was a master of space. You can see that in this painting, The School of Athens. He's also well known for his calm Madonnas and realistic portraits. Donatello, a sculptor, showed a keen knowledge of the human anatomy. His most famous work is this one right here, The Gatte Melata. Other painters such as Begini, Giorgione, Taiti, and Tintoretto, they heighten vitality in their paintings, showing the drama by their bold use of light and space. Look at this painting right over here, Jacob wrestling with the angel. Now, Europeans were very slow on picking up on paper, which was invented by a Chinese eunuch, Kai Lun, centuries earlier. But once the Europeans discovered it, they went off. See, before this, they would write on parchment that was made from sheepskin and to make one book you needed the skin from 25 sheep and then you had to write on the parchment by hand as a result many people not only never owned a book but many had never even seen one now the Medici family wanted to have a library of 200 books and thank goodness they used paper. If they had used sheepskin, it would have taken 5,000 sheep. But nevertheless, you had to write on these books by hand. So they hired 45 copyists who worked nonstop for two years. The Chinese were using block printing and Bi Sheng had invented movable type 400 years before the so-called inventor Johannes Gutenberg did it in Europe. But no matter, printing presses were established with movable type and they spread over 18 European countries. In the late 15th century, 8 million books were printed. So now information and knowledge could travel faster than ever, faster and much more accurate. A Dutch priest named Erasmus was considered the greatest of humanists. He wrote many books attacking vices, evils, superstitions, war, and hypocrisy. He translated the Bible into Latin using Greek sources, discovering many errors in the process. Now, Erasmus hated stupidity, so don't say anything stupid in front of him. But while he hated stupid people, he praised deep 
thinking, reason. He kept correspondence with many scholars and laid the foundation for humanism in what was later introduced in England, especially in the University of Oxford. Erasmus had corresponded with Thomas More of England. Thomas More wrote Utopia, where he criticized evil and described an ideal imaginary community. And this helped bring a lot of legislation to help the poor. Sir Thomas More was a friend of King Henry VIII, but because More was not in favor of King Henry VIII's marriage to Anne Boleyn, More got his head cut off. Now, this painting of Thomas More was done by artist Hans Holbein the Younger from Germany, who painted many lifelike portraits of the royal family. In England, Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales, a series of body stories. In Spain, Miguel de Cervantes wrote Don Quixote de la Mancha, one of the world's greatest novels. The novel praises bravery and goodness, while at the same time ridicules knighthood and foolish, impractical ideals. Now, we clearly know Don Quixote lost his mind. We laugh at his impossible quest to right the wrongs of the world. We know he will lose, but we applaud the nobility nonetheless. Then there is the name of William Shakespeare, who wrote great stories, epic history, had a keen understanding of the human personality, and unmatched in the use of poetry and prose. Many plays came from his writings, such as Julius Caesar, Macbeth, Hamlet, of course, Romeo and Juliet, and Othello. We also see a dark side to humanism in being all that you can be and climbing to the top. In Shakespeare's tragedy, Macbeth, the play denounces the unbridled ambition for power. But in doing so, you see a Scottish general, Macbeth, an immoral man with an immoral wife, stopping at nothing to become king. And while he and his wife pay a terrible price for their evil ways, he and she are the protagonists that we're supposed to follow. And this brings about in literature the anti-hero. We admire sometimes the anti-hero because they're unconventional. They don't follow the rules of society. And a lot of these anti-heroes do have noble causes, but some of them don't. We follow in our culture these evil men who will stop at nothing to get what they want. We admire people who uh, break the rules, break conventions, all for the greater good, and they should be celebrated. But along the way, there are some people that are very poor and they climb to the top to enforce their evil ways. We have to be careful. One of the biggest byproducts of humanism is the battle between religion and science. Uh, along the way, though, we get democracy. And democracy, unfortunately, leads people to believe that one person's ignorance might be equal to the other person's knowledge. That is not true. But we're living in an exciting time. We have the internet, which gives us knowledge at the tips of our fingertips. And, uh, it reminds me of a scene from the movie Goodwill Hunting where Matt Damon, a blue collar worker who is self-educated, stands up against an Ivy League snob. He tells him, you wasted $150,000 on an education that I got with a dollar and 50 cents of late charges at the library. Brilliant. My next video will be the age of discovery. But in the meantime, tell me what you think. Comment below. Better yet, subscribe. Thanks for watching. This is Cool Talk.